Welcome to Future of Freedom. I'm your host, Scott Bertram. Future of Freedom is a production of America's Talking Network. You can check out all of our great podcasts at americastalking.com. Joining me today is Dr. Alan P. Mendenhall. We'll talk about the Philadelphia Society and more. Dr. Mendenhall is Associate Dean in the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University, a former trustee at the Philadelphia Society, a policy advisor for the Heartland Institute, also involved with the General Fellowship Program for the last seven years at the Philadelphia Society, and soon to be program manager for the Future of Freedom Fellowship Program at the Philly Society. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Uh, Alan, thanks so much for joining us. Scott, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. So tell us, what is the Philadelphia Society? Why does it exist? What is the mission? Well, the mission is uh, easily stated. I'll just read from it. It's to sponsor the interchange of ideas through discussion and writing in the interest of deepening the intellectual foundation of a free and ordered society and of broadening the understanding of its basic principles and traditions. In pursuit of this end, we shall examine a wide range of issues, economic, political, cultural, religious, and philosophic. We shall seek understanding, not conformity. I think the key phrase in that well, there are several key phrases, but I think the most important to me personally is that last line, we shall seek understanding, not conformity. So this membership organization brings together disparate elements of what we might call uh, conservatism. So you'll see uh, individualism, classical liberalism, traditionalism, libertarianism, and other schools of related thought all brought together to debate the most important matters facing society at any given moment. Uh, the Philadelphia Society was founded with sort of the long view in mind. Uh, what was the Intercollegiate Society for Individualists, now ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, um, the president at, at the time was uh, Victor Milioni, and, of a, and, uh, and he wrote a letter to Notre Dame professor Gerhard Niemeyer talking about how important education was to the future of conservatism and that broadening the base of ideas would be more important in the long run than any political victory. So a lot of conservatism then as now focused on getting Republicans elected to the House of Representatives or to the Senate or getting people into office. And there were some uh, scholars who thought that may be a little too short-sighted, that to build a broad coalition and a lasting movement, you needed intellectual foundations. And that's why the Philadelphia Society is dedicated to the goal of deepening these intellectual foundations of a free and ordered society. So who is a member of the society? How do you become one? Is it a secret society? What, what's, uh, what's the membership all about? Well, it's not expressly a secret society. People have talked about it as though it were a secret society. But to uh, to join, you have to attend a meeting. And to attend a meeting, you have to be invited by a member as a guest. After you have attended a meeting, you can uh, be eligible for membership if somebody puts you up for membership. And then you have to get uh, different sponsors and your uh, application would go before a membership committee of the board, and then it would go through the full board, and then it would have to go through the entire membership of the Philadelphia Society. So everybody everybody who's a member has been approved by the entire membership. There is a, a big yay or nay vote that can keep people in or, um, uh, or get people in or keep them out. Um, and so that's generally the process. The, the Philadelphia Society has had several distinguished members over the year and uh, over the years and many distinguished speakers. I mean, if you look at the list of people mm -hmm. who have spoken at Philadelphia Society meetings, uh, you'll see names as wide ranging as Paul Ryan and Murray Rothbard. You'll see Wendell Berry and Robert Bork. You'll see uh, sort of Southern conservatives like Mel Bradford and and people like Ellis Sandeau or Eric Vogelin, philosophers like Eric Vogelin or Victor Davis Hanson, who's a big name currently, or sort of classical liberals like Milton Friedman. Um, fusionists like Frank Meyer, um, and another Southern conservative, Forrest McDonald, uh, Irving Kristol, the uh, father of, 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 of uh, you know, sort of our, our crystal that we see on Fox News and the, the former, um, you know, Weekly Standard Crystal, mm -hmm. uh, announced his departure from socialism at a speech in the Philadelphia Society meeting. Russell Kirk was an early staple of the Philadelphia Society and a long-term member 
Uh, so, um, you, you know, you just have a wide range of people represented in the society and not everyone agrees. I think you'll find more disagreement among members at a Philadelphia society than you would at, say, other conservative think tanks or other uh, scholarly or, um, you know, conservative conferences. Because the whole point of the Philadelphia Society is to hash out these ideas and to put them into conflict. And it's the collision of thought that results in coalitions being formed and not in the spirit of compromise, but in the spirit of, uh, of, of making progress. You quoted earlier and uh, from the Philadelphia Society, uh, essentially saying progress made by achieving insight and understanding, not by enforcing intellectual conformity, this, this collision of ideas you, you talk about. Is there a time that you can remember or recall when you have been swayed or your mind has been changed by the introduction to these different kinds of ideas, a, a different point of view at the Philadelphia Society? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I've had any premises changed, but I've looked at issues in a different way. There was a very robust meeting in 2016, immediately before the presidential uh, uh, election. I think it was October, and of course, you know, November's when the election was, and it was, there was a, a final panel about sort of thinking about Trump and Trumpism, and it was a heated conversation. The panelists were were heated, and after the um, after the session, that final session, people sort of uh, embarked in, into the bars, and uh, there were lively conversations and heated conversations about whether to support Trump and Trumpism, whether he had a shot to beat Hillary Clinton, what uh, his views on trade, for example, or immigration meant for the future of conservatism or the Republican Party. And that was a very interesting meeting because I remember being surprised at the people who were supporting Trump and surprised at some of the people who weren't. And I was able to look at different issues in a, in a new way and to see where the fault lines were occurring. And they were somewhat surprising. If you remember in those days, you had National Review coming out with an entire issue that was against Trump. And then you had sort of the Claremont Institute conservatives who were very pro-Trump. Well, if you had rewinded a little over a decade or back to the Iraq war, you know, you had those Claremont people in the National Review in lockstep. And here they were um, in very different positions. And I thought that sort of transition was very interesting. And we had the right people in the room, scholars and journalists and lawyers and business professionals and educators of, of a variety uh, at a variety of levels coming together to make sense of that moment. Talking with Dr. Alan Mendenhall with us on the uh, Philadelphia Society here on the Future of Freedom podcast. The current uh, Philadelphia Society president, Dr. Bill McClay, is a professor of history here at Hillsdale College, too. In his letter, his introductory letter as president, he said, these are difficult and dismaying times, and the society is united in trepidation. What's unique, different about these current times that is causing that level of uncertainty, perhaps, among some members? Well, I think there is a, uh, uh, you know, there, there are different movements on the right that we haven't seen. There was a time when fusionism was sort of valued, while there were ways to hold together different elements of the right in, in, in a way that is more difficult now. I think you see uh, this rise of national conservatism. I think there um, are tensions within the uh, economics of conservatism. So you have some advocating a return to industrial policy and a very national and nationalist and American first view. You have Adrian Vermeule's common good uh, constitutionalism, and you have Patrick Deneen talking about the failure of liberalism, and then you have, on the other side, people that are still working in the vein of Austrian economics or, um, you know, a more Milton Friedman uh, version of free market economics. And these different schools of thought are becoming increasingly difficult to hold together as the people that are more anti-economics See, uh, see the economic way of thinking as atomizing, as uh, utilitarian, 
and destructive to communities and families, whereas uh, you have, say, the libertarian uh, strain looking at those schools and suggesting that they are harming communities by diminishing opportunities for prosperity or uh, or uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So, you know, I think we're just in a, in, a, in a new moment where we're having to work through these things. But there's a book called Conversations on Conservatism that my friends Marcus Witcher, Blake Ball, and, and Kevin Hughes uh, co-edited. I guess it was 2020, maybe 2021. But if, if you look at the editor's note at the beginning of that, Marcus points out that the conservative moment stands at a, at a crossroads now, but it has also been there many, many times after Goldwater's defeat in 64, during the Vietnam War, at the end of the Cold War, during the 94 congressional elections, um, when we had the George W. Bush administration and the Iraq War, um, and then, you know, in this era of Donald Trump. So we're not in a new place. It feels new because it's present and mm. it's current, but we have had to wrestle with these issues before and sometimes different strains of the right will gain footing or ground, but then uh, they may recede in importance depending on how circumstances evolve over time. The 60th anniversary of the Philadelphia Society is in 2024, just a couple of years away. What would you say has been accomplished during that time? What's the value of the society over those 60 years? Well, I think bringing together people who are experts in their field, who are High, the highest level thinkers who really want to achieve freedom for our society, society and to uh, promote and encourage young scholars. I think that the Philadelphia Society has been a place for uh, introducing fresh thought and young people, not just to the old ideas, but to present those old ideas in new ways, to pour old wine into new wineskins, so to speak, and to give them a voice and a, and a platform and an opportunity to test out their theories within an audience full of very seasoned professionals who can provide criticism and feedback. And I can assure you that the uh, criticism and feedback abound. <laughs> the, uh, the audience of the Philadelphia Society is quick to point out when they disagree. Um, so I think that's very important. And I think just fostering that exchange of ideas is critical to conservatism writ large because there just aren't very many organizations that are willing to bring together those different factions. It seems as though everybody is attempting, each organization has their own sort of particular base of donors and particular vision, and they are trying to push a particular agenda or way of viewing things, whereas the Philadelphia Society, by uh, by its own mission, seeks to be a uh, pluralistic and to hold these ideas in tension with one another without one coming to dominate the other. It really is a society, a place where people come together to talk and to debate and uh, to determine where consensus is possible. So that is where I think the Philadelphia Society is uniquely situated. If there is going to be a continued fusionism within conservatism, I believe it's the Philadelphia Society that will make it possible. In, in introducing these young fellows, these young students to the old ideas, as you say, is there a is there an inherent uh, problem or, or or bias against entertaining new ideas or new ways of thinking in these varied corners of the right of conservatism that come uh, together in the Philadelphia Society? Well, I, I would say that you'll certainly see that that. that there are people that bring new ideas to the table at meetings, uh, you know, occasionally. But conservatism, by its very nature, is sort of resistant to change. And so you'll see some people in the audience who have very strong feedback when an idea seems maybe too new. And that's okay. It's okay to introduce those new ideas and to uh, have the pushback as well. I think part of the filtering process of history is submitting ideas for testing and experimentation and finding out what works, what doesn't, separating the wheat from the chaff. And that takes time and it does take, you know, some introduction of, of, of new voices and new ideas. And it turns out that sometimes what we perceive to be 
new is actually just a restated or repurposed version of the old. And that can be an interesting um, that can be an interesting thing to deal with as as well. I believe that uh, one thing that the Philadelphia Society has done very well since the 50th anniversary, I can't believe we're already coming up <laughs> on 60, but uh, since the 50th anniversary, we have been very intentional intentional about getting more uh, young people involved. I know I was a trustee from 2018 to 2022. I got an extra year because of COVID, <laughs> but I directed the fellowship committee. But even before that time, in 2016, I, I directed a professional development colloquium for junior scholars at the fall meeting in philadelphia then i did another one in 2017 on federalism in uh in mclean virginia and then i did another one in 2018 in the fall at fort worth and each of these featured sort of distinguished members of the society i think don divine participated matt spaulding participated bill mcclay rj pastrito george nash i'm sure i'm forgetting people lenore ely of course was at all of them and these were really interesting events where young people got to come into contact with others who were outside of their field and discipline. And I was unaware at how siloed these young people had become. There was a particularly uh, charged debate over same-sex marriage at one of these um, meetings, and the economists were – in conflict with some, uh, there, there was a, a particular law student from at the time. He was a he was a law student at Harvard Law School. He's now an attorney, who was defending sort of his views on traditional marriage. And I remember the economist being quite surprised at the rationale and reasoning and level of understanding of the Harvard law student. And I believe that both sides by the end had come to appreciate the others views to a deeper degree but neither side was um, convinced of the other of the other no one changed their mind but i do think there was a, a much deeper respect felt toward the other side after after basically having a, a knockdown drag out argument about it and of course in the most civil of ways but i think that was an extremely effective moment for um, both those different camps and sort of the the in a in a, in a in a micro level, the type of exchange the Philadelphia Society seeks to facilitate and foster. You've worked with these fellows at the Philadelphia Society for the past seven years or so. How do these young scholars become introduced to conservatism? Where are they? Where's their entry point? Most of them are getting there through a particular professor. Now, academia has fewer and fewer people in sort of these levels of conservatism, but a lot of them are coming um, from places like Hillsdale. Hillsdale sends its own group of fellows every single year to meetings, but uh, they come from people who have been recommended by faculty members. Every now and then we'll get somebody who has been interested in Republican politics and has come up through working on campaigns or something like that. And then in the process of doing that, they've discovered somebody who is operating in the world of ideas. They, they, they've been you know, recommended Russell Kirk. And so they'll read Russell Kirk and that will lead them to read somebody else and then to read somebody else. And they start realizing, oh, there's there's a profound intellectual tradition to conservatism. Most people up on Capitol Hill aren't sitting there reading Michael Oakeshott or something <laughs> like that. You know, they, they just aren't familiar with these figures. And so I think it's revelatory for young people to discover that there is this really exciting and deep and profound tradition of conservatism and when they learn about that they get really curious and that's that's the type of person that we see applying to our fellowship programs now this this future for freedom fellows that we're going right now we, we have to select 12 people and right now i'm looking at a list of 51 applications so we are going <laughs> to have our work cut out but it's really exciting and these these names come from Ivy League institutions, they come from think tanks, they come from higher education. It is just an incredibly impressive array of young people, and I'm excited by, um, by that growth. I, I know when I first started working with the fellowship program, we were not getting so many applications, and, uh, and so we weren't able to be as selective as we had hoped to be. And 
over these last seven years, we have really, really improved this program. And now we're highly selective. We're having to turn away people who frankly should be coming, but because <laughs> But because we you know we have limited you know resources and and spots available, we just can't accept everybody. But it, it's astounding how much higher the quality. I know that sounds like a, a, a sort of a, a bad way of putting it, like people they're bad quality applicants. But really, just it, just the level of intelligence and promise that these young people are bringing to the table is truly remarkable and encouraging to me. It gives me a lot of hope for the future of. Uh, both conservatism and our country in some of its darkest moments. Dr. Alan P. Mendenhall is with us on the Future of Freedom podcast. You can find out more about the Philadelphia Society at phillysoc.org. Milton Friedman was a founding member of the Philadelphia Society, and I still find that his work, the, the, the Free to Choose video series, the campus visits that are up on YouTube, are incredibly effective ways of introducing young people to these ideas of freedom and liberty. Why are they still so effective after 40 years? Why is he still so relevant after all this time? How do we find the new Freedmans? Well, it's interesting that you bring up Milton Freeman in particular. I have a group of students from Troy University who are up at Kapitoff right now as we speak. They would have flown out. I can't remember if it was yesterday. I think it was yesterday. They would have flown out yesterday and gone up to Capitoff, which is Milton and Rose Freeman's summer home in Vermont, and they're going to be spending a week there uh, reading Milton Freeman's work and discussing it. And the uh, the faculty leader from Troy who is running that is, is my colleague Stephen Miller, who is a conservative Catholic but also a very free market economist. Hmm. And uh, he's one of those people that embodies fusionism, and I, I really think he's a neat thinker who needs more attention. But, uh, you know, Milton Freeman – was very good at delivering a succinct message, and now you can find his his videos in two minute shorts, yeah. and uh, that's even 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 better. But how do you find these people? I think it's through these fellowship programs, and I think there needs to be, and I don't mean to to criticize the older generation, but there needs to be some eye toward looking looking to uh, succession plans. You know, you see it with institutions all the time. A university needs to develop a succession plan for when its president. Uh, they say it's got a long-serving president, and he needs to have people in place to to uh, ensure a, a smooth transition of power. Well, I think the conservative movement needs to look to that, and it can't just be within politics because politics is so ephemeral. And I say that in in sort of the political party terms, the Republican Party sort of politics, getting people elected, uh, because the conservative movement is so much more than that, and its traditions are so much older than that, that there really needs to be serious thinking about how to identify and develop young talent and figure out who those people are out, out there doing interesting and neat things who maybe need more attention, who uh, need more uh, support for their work who need more exposure to their work. And, uh, you know, I think that's on people that are maybe at the older generation of, of conservatism to start figuring out uh, which young people to cultivate and, and to nurture and to ensure that uh, the movement continues uh, in the absence of some of these older generations. I don't know what generation I, I'm in, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, but I feel as if I have a role on both sides of it. <laughs> so... I, I can I can work with the old and I can work with the new, and I'd probably fall somewhere in between. Over on the Philadelphia Society website, there's also a series of great lectures, the Voices of Conservatism, and that goes back decades. Is there value? What is the value in listening back to discussions and debates about issues that have long been settled? Um, is it sort of the uh, everything old is new again? We're bound to have these debates once again. Yeah, I think, you know, the old uh, Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun comes to mind that, uh, you know, we do debate some of the same issues, but in different contexts. And, uh, you know, while, while the particulars and specificities change, sort of the broad general debates remain roughly the same. I mentioned that edited volume Conversations on Conservatism that Marcus Witcher, Blake Ball, and Kevin Hughes did. And they edited um, several chapters. I can't remember how many chapters, but more more than ten, or maybe ten. And uh, 
each of those chapters, it was conversations on conservatism. So they're about the definition of conservatism, what it means to be conservative, um, you know, what are the parameters of conservatism. And there are uh, a number of lectures by sort of fascinating figures. Milton Freeman was one of them. Russell Kirk's another. Frank Meyer was another. Um, Walter Burns was another. Even Murray Rothbard makes an appearance there. And Stan Evans and George Nash. And Marcus and I and Kevin Hughes are currently working on a second iteration of that book, and it will be Controversies in mm -hmm. Conservatism. So we're looking for old Philadelphia Society meetings in which there were sort of explosions when there were uh, the most heated exchanges and the most controversial um, uh, panels in the past. And, and we're going to try to produce a volume in that vein. And I think that will be a really interesting work. We still got uh, a lot to do on it, but uh, we're, we're going through all the old speeches and figuring out which ones we think might qualify. And, uh, you know, we've had debates on issues like trade or immigration uh, numerous times, and that seems to be an issue that will never be settled. But, uh, you know, there are other other exchanges that um, will, I think, become interesting. And I don't want to do a spoiler alert or something <laughs> like that, but, uh, but anybody that wants to go through the Philadelphia Society's website and listen to all those old speeches can probably figure out for themselves which speeches they are. Hmm. You wrote a piece for Public Discourse a while back on the news and inside made the argument that simply gathering information is not educational. So what more is needed than just the information for people to, to learn, to be educated? Well, I think people need to read widely and deeply. Even when you're reading, let's say you're reading a, a history book. I learned in, in, in graduate school a... a um, a reading method called gutting books. And let's say you had to read some very specific period of history when you, uh, for, for a class or something or whatever, you're going to read the book and you are not going to remember all the minutia. You're not going to remember every detail in 10 years. But when you read several books on that same subject, you'll retain some of that data, some of that information, but uh, what's more important is that you retain a sense of the larger sweep of history and are able to contextualize different trends, different changes over time, so that your own particular moment doesn't seem so unique or that you do not seem too condescending or presentist when you view the past and look at the past. The past is not some giant deposit of bad things, it actually uh, has much use for us. In fact, it, it, it is the uh, record of all human interaction over time. And if you don't consult it, you will find yourself making mistakes that have been made in the past. I, I, my, my friend Jason Jewell had a funny Facebook post the other, the other day. He was talking about, yep, the ancients were definitely a lot smarter than we were. And he, he linked to some uh, uh, article and was saying, just view the comments if you want any evidence of this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think the news now, the 24-hour news cycle is becoming sort of a distraction. It's becoming infotainment, so to speak. And it uh, it is useful as things go because we live in the world and need to operate in the world in which we live in and we have to you know understand who's who and who's making trends happen and that sort of thing but uh but i also think in order to make informed decisions and to be a truly literate person and the proper understanding of the term literate is, is somebody who's you know, well versed in in literature and philosophy and history and different uh, disciplines, what we now call disciplines. I think you need to read well and widely, and to uh, challenge yourself, and to uh, you know consider some of the best works that have been taught and read over the centuries. Final question for Dr. Alan P. Mendenhall as we talk about the Philadelphia Society, phillysoc.org. Many conversations about how we can restore, how we can regain a healthier public culture, a healthier uh, public debate among these very important issues, particularly pertaining to freedom and liberty. Is the Philadelphia Society 
uh, somewhat of a model of what can be done? Or is the scope, the size of what needs to be done on the national level too big? Oh, wow. Yeah, the, the, I, I, this is just me personally. I don't know if I can, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Philadelphia Society or anybody as, when I answer this question, but I, I personally am concerned about the size and scale and scope of, of our country right now. And I'm also, on the other hand, encouraged by sort of the move toward decentralization. I think we see this in the Dobbs case and in many other cases that our more conservative Supreme Court is handing down. And I suspect we will come to see a uh, country that maybe is more splintered, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I think that states like Florida, which were purple in the past, are becoming more red. And I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged to see uh, the conservatism that Hispanics are bringing to uh, Florida, for example, and uh, commitment to sort of that that Catholic uh, tradition that's sort of sweeping um, politics in Florida. And that's that's exciting to me. I think our country is going to look very different in 50 years. You know, maybe we'll have different territorial boundaries. I don't know. But, uh, but I think this movement toward decentralization is necessary in order to diffuse and disperse power and therefore uh, lower the stakes. I think when you have everything centralized and everything nationalized, the stakes just become so high mm -hmm. that people are on the verge of violence and people are are wanting to hurt and harm one another. But if the stakes weren't so high, if they fell back to the states, if things were brought closer to the local level, I think government would be more representative of the people. And I think that the potential for violence and conflict would be reduced. Dr. Alan P. Mendenhall is Associate Dean and Professor in the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University, former trustee at the Philadelphia Society, policy advisor for the Heartland Institute, and also will be heading up as program manager the Future of Freedom Fellowship Program at the Philadelphia Society. More on the society at phillysoc.org. Alan, thanks so much for joining us here on the Future of Freedom podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I had a great time. I'm Scott Bertram. For more episodes of the Future of Freedom podcast and other fine productions of America's Talking Network, check out americastalking.com or wherever you find your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Future of Freedom, presented by America's Talking Network. Thank you.